I was asked uh, to talk about non-medical treatment of epilepsy, meaning to say uh, treatment of epilepsy without anti-epileptic medications. Um, so these are the main alternative treatments that we use as epileptologists. Um, but I will touch a little bit briefly uh, at the end of the talk about the anti-epileptic medications because they still remain very important. And a lot of patients who had surgery, who are receiving the ketogenic diet or had a vagal nerve stimulator are still taking anti-epileptic medications, actually the majority of them. So just looking at the outline, I'm going to talk very briefly about the types of epilepsy, just in a kind of very uh, easy, simple way. And when we consider alternative modalities other than anti-epileptic medications or anti-epileptic drugs, uh, we'll talk a little bit about surgery, uh, when to persevere and when to just let go of it, and uh, the ketogenic diet, the myths and the facts and the questions, and the vagal nerve stimulator, who do we use it for and what do we expect. And with each of these, there's always a bit of reality check, because all is not what it seems to be. Uh, and to conclude uh, a little bit about anti-epileptic medications and how it is important to know uh, the types of epilepsy syndromes when we're choosing what type of medication to use. So generally speaking, the easiest way really to look at types of epilepsy is to divide them into two major categories. One of them is generalized and one of them is focal. And generalized means that it comes from all over the brain at the same time, and focal means that it comes from a particular focus or as a particular onset of the seizures. Most of the generalized epilepsies, the epilepsies that presumably come from all over the brain all the time, have a genetic underlying reason. And it doesn't mean that we know a particular gene, but it's a genetic susceptibility, like saying, for example, a family has a susceptibility to asthma, to diabetes, to epilepsy, etc. Uh, focal epilepsies can be genetic or can be structural. And structural means that there's a particular structural problem with the brain in one particular area that's causing seizures, like, for example, a tumor, uh, someone born with an area that's not developed properly, properly in the brain, uh, after brain injury, so someone had a head injury and there's a bleed and there's a scar, a tumor, etc., etc. And then there are focal epilepsies with possible structural causes, meaning to say that everything from the information we see from our tests and the EEG says there might be a structural problem, but the MRI tells you that there ain't one, which is not always the case. And then there are clear focal epilepsies that don't have an underlying structural problem. So just think in your mind, generalized focal, and if it's focal, is it genetic or structural? And you'll never go wrong. So what I want to focus uh, today about is to talk about uh, the surgically remediable epilepsies first, uh, and that means that the focal resectable. So not everyone who has a focal epilepsy because of a structural problem, you can do surgery on them. And the reason for that is that you can have a structural problem that lies in an area that's responsible for a very important function. So for example, movement, so in the motor region, speech, memory, etc. So you treat epilepsy in order to make a person function better. So it's no good for me to say, well, you have epilepsy and I'm going to take your motor strip out and have you paralyzed, but your seizures are gone. Sometimes we have to do that, but these are the things that we have to think about. You have to excuse the images in my, in my talk because we're very kind of children oriented in Temple Street, but um, this applies to both children and adults. So if someone has a structural abnormality in the brain and we go and take it out surgically, does that ensure a cure? And the answer to that is no, not always, not always. If it's a very well circumscribed lesion or problem that we can see, like for example, tumors are a very good example of that. Usually when you take the tumor out, usually epilepsy is cured if you can take it all out. But if you had a large area of the brain that is not developed properly and you can't take it all out, and you know that you haven't taken it all out, then the percentage that you give to a patient for possibility of seizure freedom becomes less. It doesn't mean that you refrain from surgery. You may offer surgery with a lesser percentage of seizure freedom. So I say to a patient, there's a 95% chance that you'll improve, but a 50% chance of seizure freedom, which is sometimes not a bad deal. Antiepileptic medications, using them for patients who have resectable lesions or resectable problems, is that faffing about? Sometimes it is. So if you have a clear structural abnormality that's causing seizures and the seizures are not really responding to one or two medications, you should be very quickly considering surgery. 
But there are patients who will not be good surgical candidates. There are patients who we know will remain on antiepileptic medications after surgery. So you don't ignore the antiepileptic medications and trying to refine them and tailor them to the patient's need and to try and get the best seizure control possible because they're probably going to have to stay on board after surgery. But not always. Antiepileptic medications generally, we try as much as we can, as you all know, that we try to use them to get the best seizure control and less side effects. But that continues to be the same philosophy for patients who've had surgery and patients who have a vagal nerve stimulator, etc. However, I'm a big advocate of surgery and uh, if I have a hint in my mind that that patient has a, a slight chance of surgery, I will always, always offer it and I will always pursue it. Uh, who has to have surgery and who is a good candidate for surgery? And we look at this from analyzing our EEGs largely. Uh, with the MRI, of course, helping us and supporting us. But we say one persistent focus, and when I say that, it means that every time you have an EEG, it tells you that the problem is in that area, the problem is in that area, the problem is in that area. It doesn't go anywhere else. Even if the MRI is thought to be normal, you have to pursue surgery on these patients. And sometimes we do do surgery on patients who don't have clear lesions to see on the MRI. And I say the focus and the onus, and the onus really is on your doctor who's seeing you, that if you do have a persistent focus that's coming every single time from one particular area, then that possibility has to be visited, whether by him or by sending you to someone who will visit it more thoroughly. An important question uh, that people ask me is, uh, I say to someone, have you had an MRI scan? They say, no, but we had a CT. CT scans, of course, are important in acute situations where they will rule out a big stroke or a big bleed or a big tumour, but they are not something that we do routinely to investigate epilepsy simply because it doesn't show the very subtle abnormalities of brain development and the little scars that we see after birth in patients who have focal epilepsy. So if you have focal epilepsy that's not responding to treatment and you go to, you're getting a, an image of the brain, it has to be an MRI. And then we record seizures before surgery, so we're, I'm sure all of you heard of uh, video EEG telemetry, so patients who have a persistent focus, and we've seen it on their routine EEG, the half-hour EEG or the hour EEG, uh, we bring them in and we try to record the seizures, make sure that they're all coming from one place, and then we marry that with the image, the MRI image, and then we proceed to discuss surgery. But that's only if seizures are a problem. So if you're taking one anti-epileptic medication, you have no side effects, and you're seizure-free, and you have a structural abnormality that is not a tumour that has to be removed, we will probably say to you, well, one medication, no side effects, we shouldn't do the surgery. It's true that we look at surgery in a very familiar way now because we do a lot of it and we're very comfortable with it, but it's no joke. Brain surgery is no joke, and those who had brain surgery will tell you. Uh, I'm not scaring you of epilepsy surgery, I'm the first one to, to be an advocate for it, but I do have a couple of patients who would have a small structural lesion, very well controlled and a small dose of anti-epileptic medication, no side effects. We keep surgery uh, as an option in the back of our mind, and of course if seizures return and we need to use another anti-epileptic medication, by all means, why not? That is a rare situation, to have someone with a structural abnormality well, very well controlled on one antiepileptic medication. But it's something to keep in mind. And just to give you an idea about some of the MRIs, uh, some of them are so obvious, uh, rather in your face. So this is a person who had one side, one half of his brain underdeveloped. It's larger, it looks less sophisticated, it looks very crude, hasn't developed properly, and all it's doing is causing a lot of seizures and probably weakness down the other side of the body. And the solution in this patient is very easy and it's very clear. You just take that half of the brain out. Or you disconnect it completely. It has no function. And people look at you and say, what do you mean take half the brain out? It means that when you're born with this kind of abnormality, the other side of your brain is programmed to take on all the other functions. So I have about four or five patients who have only half a brain and they're walking around and talking as if nothing's happened. <laughs> If you have an abnormality of such nature, the epilepsy will disable you completely. You won't be able to speak, to learn, to do anything, and it has to come out. And in a way, people who have this kind of abnormality are lucky that it's so obvious and it's so clear and it's causing a huge amount of trouble at the very onset of their epilepsy and the treatment is surgical. Medications will never work for something like this. We can talk in detail a little bit later. Um, this is another MRI that, although it might not seem to be abnormal, it is quite abnormal. Um, and if you look at the, um, th this side of the brain here, and you can see how sophisticated it looks, it's just a bit smudged on that side, would you? Does anyone see that a little bit? So that guy had uh, refractory epilepsy for years and years and years, and the MRI was thought to be normal, but in actual fact, 
I look at it and I call it very abnormal and he's had epilepsy surgery and he's nearly seizure free now. Going to school, started to speak from the age of seven years, he didn't have a word before the operation. And then there's the very hardly seen, there's a little blob here that looks a little bit kind of uh, out of key here, yeah? And that also is thought to be normal, but it's actually an area of what we call cortical dysplasia, which is an area of maldevelopment or abnormal development that's very focal, very localized, as opposed to the huge blob that we have here, yeah? Uh, so these are the tricky ones. And then there's ones that are really very kind of, people call them flimsy, and you can see the font that I wrote is in very, very light grey and it says they're ridiculous, ridiculously subtle uh, and it's just really a matter of looking at the symmetry between the two sides and the, the margins between the, the darker areas and the, and the lighter areas and how they can be just a little bit smudged and this person had refractory epilepsy for about nine years but he's had epilepsy surgery recently based upon this MRI scan and his EEGs and he's seizure free now. So very subtle abnormality. But not all structural abnormalities are for surgery, so there's a disorder, for example, called lysencephaly, whereby the surface of the brain looks very smooth. You can see it there compared to the normal uh, brain. You can't do resective surgery on this patient. What are you going to resect? All of the brain is abnormal. And there's another entity on the other side of the slide called double cortex, which is another generalized uh, cortical malformation or brain malformation that we can't do resective surgery on when, as soon as possible, when all the data is clear and married up with, it, with, with each other, so the EEG data, the MRI data, and we also do what we call neuropsychology assessment, meaning to say that we uh, get the neuropsychologist to examine the different functions and how the patient is functioning in his frontal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, etc., etc., to see if he's a good candidate, if he'll be able to support the functions in his life with what remains after you take the problem out. You must be proactive with controlling seizures medically in the interim and this applies maybe, it applies to everyone, there's no doubt, but more so to little children because losing a month or two months in the first year of life is not like losing two or three months of cognition as an adult. When you've, when you've learned and you've become an adult and you've reached your maximum potential, it's fine. But in the first year of life, each month is like a long, long, long lifetime of learning and development. And losing these months can be a big problem. So if, if, if you're planning for surgery and thinking about it, don't abandon your medications. Make sure that you're trying to stay on top of the epilepsy. Reality check, percentage and projection of seizure freedom. As I said to you, if someone has a very clear tumor that is resectable and you can take it out, there's no problem. We can even give a percentage of 95% seizure freedom. Quick note on MRI scan results. Not every MRI scan that is labeled as abnormal means that it's the cause of your epilepsy. So for example, we know that a lot of patients have little spots scattered in their brain that we see on MRI images. And if you walk down to Lemoore Central or O'Connell Street and pick 50 patients and put them into an MRI scanner, a lot of them will have what we call non-specific spots. Uh, these non-specific spots don't cause epilepsy. They can sometimes seem to be more in one person than another, but they get mentioned in an MRI report and the conception is that that might be the cause of the epilepsy. No. A lot of cysts that people are born with, that we call arachnoid cysts, can be seen and can be very large, and they often don't cause epilepsy. So having an abnormal MRI doesn't mean that it's the cause of your epilepsy. And this we call false positive. And then there's the false negative. So the patients, the patients that I showed you with the very subtle abnormalities are often reported formally as normal, but they actually have very subtle abnormalities that with a little bit more scrutinization, you can find out uh, that they're not completely normal. Main message, behavior. So I, of course, speak from a child's perspective more. A lot of patients that come to us would have a mild epilepsy, but horrible behavior. And epilepsy surgery is not made to correct anyone's behavior. It's made to treat seizures, and it's aimed to treat seizures. So if you know that the behavior is an independent problem of the epilepsy, you have to tackle that separately. It doesn't mean that you can't do epilepsy surgery by all means but you have to have realistic expectations as to what the surgery will give you. The surgery talks about seizure control. It does not talk about behavior control. By all means, if someone has seizures all the time, all the time, all the time, and it's making the behavior appalling and horrible and they're running all over the place and you make the epilepsy better, and as a secondary effect, the behavior improves, everyone's a winner, hallelujah. But don't try and sell epilepsy surgery as a treatment as for behavior for someone who has infrequent seizures. So when I have a patient that has extreme behavioral problems and moderate epilepsy, even if I'm offering surgery, I tend to look at their EEG during sleep and in between seizures. 
And if you have a very quiet EEG in between, sleep, uh, in between seizures and during sleep, it's very unlikely that your epilepsy is the only cause of your behavioral problems. And I have a lot of patients who had epilepsy surgery and are taking medication, behavior modulating medication, like the risperidones and, and the likes. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I will move to the ketogenic diet now, and I know that there's a lot of interest in the ketogenic diet. Um, this picture represents mostly kind of the sort of food stuff that you eat in this diet. And it's very, it's, it's a, I find it's a very kind of um, misleading word to use. It is a diet, but it's not like someone going on a low calorie kind of weight loss extravaganza or taking, you know, tasty milkshakes. It's not that. It's a very, very, very stringent and strict diet that we'll talk about in a second. So what is it and how does it work? It is believed that the brain functions on ketones. Ketones is, uh, is a side metabolite of lipids and it's believed that it's the brain fuel and uh, we also believe that it an has an anti-epileptic effect. How does it work as an anti-epileptic effect? We're not 100% sure. So the aim of this diet is to give you a lot of lipids, fatty, uh, dairy and stuff like that to, to increase the level of ketones in your blood and they act as an anti-convulsant or an anti-epileptic agent. And the principle is that the majority of, of your food really comes from fat and the proteins and the carbohydrates fall to the background, particularly the proteins, in order to be able to have a lot of ketones, which is a side metabolite of the lipids. So before that happens, we educate people. If we're going to put someone on the ketogenic diet, we educate people a lot. And many people, after they hear what's involved in it, refuse it. Uh, I personally like it for certain cases. But as I am as a person now, if I was offered it, I wouldn't take it. But I'm not trying to detract you from it. I'm just saying that it has a lot of lifestyle issues that we'll talk about. Um, in order for, for it to be prescribed to someone, that someone has to have really, really bad epilepsy and all medications without outstanding side effects and the appropriate medications have been used before you try and visit this, um, um, <laughs> this modality of treatment. And it's not just because it's not tasty, but it does restrict lifestyle in one or two ways, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. So kicking off what we do in the beginning, uh, we sit with the parents and uh, the ketogenic diet nurse sits with the parents and describes to them what, what the diet involves, uh, tells them uh, how much time it takes to prepare and uh, what children are allowed to eat and not allowed to eat. There's usually an initial period, sometimes people like to do it as an inpatient in the hospital for education purposes and for frequent blood tests and this is one of the things that has to be done with this diet uh, that you have to measure blood sugar and you have to uh, monitor bone growth and you have to monitor the, the child's growth and you have to measure ketones in urine at home all the time so if you have a child that's very picky with food this ain't gonna work if you have a child that likes his donuts not gonna work if you like a child that likes steak and will not eat anything but steak it will not work if you have a parent who's not willing to put a lot of time in this and actually spend a lot of time preparing meals every day or every week, it's not going to work. If you have someone with mild to moderate epilepsy, it's not a good idea because you can actually give them a much easier and nice life where they can eat and enjoy themselves with a properly chosen anti-epileptic medication with minimal side effects and render them seizure free. Technical issues, as I said, has to do with measuring uh, quantities of food and all that. And it's not a diet that you get given, it's something that you have to make at home. And there's a lot of monitoring involved. Uh, and when we look at the patient, as I said, we look at the child and the parents, so you have to be realistic. If the child, if you know that the child is not gonna stick to it, so there's no point in me coming to a teenage girl who's not taking her anti-epileptic medication, and I think she's going to stick to that diet, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. Do I give it to a child that is fussy with food? It's not gonna happen. Do I give it to a pet? Do I give it to a parent who has proven time and time again that they're not supervising the medication that they're giving to their children properly? It's not gonna happen. It's a very, very stringent, strict uh, diet. Who does it suit best? That's the question. So it's usually someone who's been on many anti-epileptic medications. Nothing has worked. Extremely important to rule out the possibility of surgery. Yeah, so surgery is extremely important to rule out because that can often make a huge difference and it can be missed. And it has to be people who are willing to take on the diet. Of course, you can understand that patients who are tube-fed, kids who are tube-fed who don't have to taste it and are always given the diet by someone else are the ones that stick to it better because they don't have to do anything. Who shouldn't have it? We've spoken about those. So there are side effects that can happen from the diet. 
uh, some of them are expected and accepted and they resolve with time. So when you're starting to give this fatty diet and the level of ketones increase in your, in your, in your body, your, ap your appetite often gets suppressed. It's not a problem. It's not a problem in the long term because people get used to it and with some perseverance it works. Some minimal vomiting, a lot of nausea, some minimal vomiting in the beginning and that also tends to rectify itself with time. Lethargy, tiredness and irritation all together. So someone who's tired and it would seem that they're so benign and they've got their head down on the desk all the time and you come and speak to them and they're like a lion. Not unusual in the beginning of the diet but it tends to uh, smooth itself out a little bit afterwards. Unacceptable side effects that have to be treated, dehydration. So people who are not taking the whole diet or ha have gone into dehydration because the quantities that they're taking are not sufficient. Ongoing vomiting can be a problem. Excessive ketosis causing all of the above at a much higher scale. And hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. So all of these things have to be monitored. And they are side effects that do happen. When the child, when the child is alone at school, he's not allowed to snack. So he has to be clear and you have to be clear that that's not happening. The school have to be clear about it. Uh, there has to be extreme strictness, much more than antiepileptic medications. Many times with antiepileptic medications, if you miss a dose, we will say, okay, well, just take an extra one at night so that you have the, you know, the levels in your blood better. But if you miss bits of the ketogenic diet, the whole thing tends to fall apart. It's like a domino effect. It's all measured. The amount of fat you take, the amount of ketosis projected, and your seizure control. Uh, intercurrent illnesses such as colds and fever can make your seizures worse and can make the ketosis worse. So this has to be readjusted. And one of the very important things is that you have to look at every single thing you're taking. So even if you're taking medication for another reason, you have to look at the nutritional information and you have to know if there's sugar in it or not because if there's too much sugar in it, you can't take it. We have to monitor the kid's weight, height and growth and bone growth as well. Uh, I don't want to sound negative about the diet because we do like it and we do use it, but we use it very, very sparingly. It is a huge undertaking for the hospital and for the family. So if I tell you in Temple Street where we have hundreds of patients with epilepsy, we have a list of about 15 on the diet over the years. Um, there are other ways of, of uh, modifying the diet. So there's different ratios that you can use to make life better. There's a modi modified Atkins diet that's often used and there's another type called the low glycemic index diet that is less stringent but we use when we use that sometimes. And always remember that the tighter the diet, the better the chances for control. And this is the reality check, is that you will not have a kid sitting, eating, <coughs> preparing his own breakfast and doing that. And everything is measured by weight you have to check everything you take, even if it's a medication that's recommended to you by a doctor. It has to be checked for its nutritional facts. And then there's the ongoing measurement of ketones in the blood and the on and off uh, blood tests. And it reminds me of the statement, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Take the truth out of it and that's the ketogenic diet. It's the diet, the whole diet and nothing but the diet. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Uh, I'll move to the vagus nerve stimulator. The vagus nerve stimulator uh, is one of my favorite modalities of treatment. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that I use it with everyone. But it is something that we use for people who have failed antiepileptic medications, or rather, medications have failed them. It's probably a better word to use. Uh, the medications have failed them completely, and they're not surgical candidates. They're not resective surgical candidates. That's the most important message. If you're to leave today with any message, that that's the case. If I see someone with a vagus nerve stimulator, in my mind, it means that everything and anything else can be done, and this is the end of the road. And it means that he's been scrutinized, MRIs have been scrutinized for possible surgical options. All the appropriate antiepileptic medications have been used before I advise for the vagus nerve stimulator. But I'm a big fan of the vagus nerve stimulator, and uh, Kathy, uh, who's with us today, will probably tell you that. Okay. So what is the vagus nerve? The vagus nerve is one of what we call the cranial nerves. Uh, so we have a lot of nerves in our body that come out of our spine. So nerves that go to our legs and to our arms, these come from the spine. But cranial nerves are nerves that originate in the head, yeah, in the brain. Um, and the vagus nerve is one of the very famous nerves in the body. Um, and what does vagus mean? Las Vegas? <laughs> it means that it wanders around. It's vague, it goes everywhere. And you can see here that it supplies nearly every organ in the body. So it goes to the intestine, it goes to the spleen, it goes to the kidney, it goes to the stomach, it goes to the heart, it goes to the larynx, it goes to the pharynx, it goes everywhere. Uh, it has a lot of supply. And we call these the efferent parts of the, of the nerve. So what goes from the head to the organs is the efferent. And then from the nerve back to the head, there are signals that go up called the afferent signals. 
And these are the ones that we tackle with the vagus nerve. So we stimulate the vagus nerve in order to modulate, if you like a better word, the brain activity and to decrease the, um, if you like, the, 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 um, the, elec the excessive electricity in a patient with epilepsy. Some people will say, well, how was it discovered? How do you know how it works? Well, we really don't know how it works exactly. Well, there are theories. And um, the, the way I like to, to, to look at it for myself, just to make life easy for myself, is that it's a taming effect on the brain. It kind of calms things down, epilepsy and other things with epilepsy. So, for example, we know that in the past, this used in the, in the origin of the VNS, it was used on a big cohort of patients with psychiatric symptoms, so schizophrenia, depression, uh, bipolar, uh, mood disorder. And uh, they got better, but it was noted that the ones that have epilepsy got much better and their seizures improved and from that time it's kind of traveled from treating psychiatric disorders to treating epilepsy um, and it does t tend to have a, a kind of a perpetuating effect which we'll talk about in a second um, of course this is the old model uh, there's a much smaller one but it remains very small it remains very small in relation to um, to the hand size it gets implanted under um, the, the, the muscle in the chest and then the wires uh, from it are wound around the vagus nerve in the neck. So you have a little scar here and a little scar here. And you don't have to do anything with it. You can't program it. There's a magnet that you can use to activate it sometimes for those who have a warning with a seizure. But I can tell you that in children, the majority of my patients don't actually get a warning. And most of patients who've had success with the VNS have nothing to do with using a magnet or activating it or not activating it. It works 24-7. There's a lot of off time and much less on time. So it works in a cycle like this. And it works 24-7. You can't do anything to it. If we want to change the, the, the settings of it, uh, we, it's done via a wand and a computer. Yeah, so very good for people who are non-compliant. Uh, how did we find out about it? We spoke and how does it work? We said we're not sure. You'll always find it on the left side never on the right, because the right vagus nerve supplies the, the heart to avoid side effects on the heart. It's not an easy way out. We use it for patients, as I said, who anti epileptic -medi medications have failed them, provided that the appropriate ones have been used. And I say that because there are patients who have had a vagal nerve stimulator in prematurely without looking at the appropriate anti epileptic medications and they didn't get better, or haven't been worked up properly for surgery. So this is something that should only happen after discussion at an epilepsy surgery meeting, which we do now. So we don't offer it anymore as a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's something that has to be discussed in the epilepsy surgery meeting. Uh, side effects, very, very few and far in between. Uh, one of the major side effects that happens at the time of stimulation is that you can get a little bit of <coughs> hoarseness of the voice because, it, because of the nerves that stimulate the larynx. But when that happens, you go down on, your, uh, in, on the intensity of the current a little bit. It can have some kind of um, controversial side effects, a little bit of uh, weight loss, a bit, bit of this and that. But generally speaking, extremely rare to see any bad side effects from it. It mostly has what I call the desired side effects. So it tends to improve the mood, it tends to improve the behavior. And a lot of patients who've had this in, even if their seizures didn't improve markedly, it tends to improve their, move and behavior, their mood and behavior quite a bit. And those who don't have seizure frequency reduction sometimes have very good seizure severity improvement. So people have very bad drop attacks and fall and injure themselves. These become much shorter, much milder, and it goes from a huge drop attack where the whole body goes down and the head gets bashed to just a little nod like that. So we look at seizure severity across the board getting better and the well-being and the alertness <coughs> and the mood being better. Uh, note on the anti-epileptic medications, a very quick note is that s a couple of patients have come to me with a vagus nerve in and I went and looked at the um, record of medications that they had and the answer was in one very simple medication that hadn't been used. So uh, this is just a message to say that it's very important to use what combination and what type of medication before you move on to the VNS, which implies that everything appropriate has been used. So make sure that everything appropriate has been used. And I'll just close with uh, remembering our ultimate aim is to have kids happy, able to play, and able to read and to achieve their maximum academic uh, potential. Thank you very much.